Welcome to this uh, evening of uh, Artistic Freedom uh, talk. Um, we're running this as a triple kind of, or maybe quadruple kind of, of streaming from Riksenen in Oslo, a national venue for traditional music and dance. And uh, we're running this also as part of the Norwegian Artistic Freedom Week, or Fri Kunst, as we say. We have one week of a focus on artistic freedom. This is connected to the uh, Music Freedom Day initiated by Free Muse, and we do it for one week here. And in addition, we also run this as part of the Safe Haven Freedom Talks today at Free Kunst. And this is the sixth edition of Safe Havens. So welcome everyone. Nice to have you here, and uh, looking forward to have you joining us through this hour. Uh, today's uh, theme is indigenous peoples and artistic freedom. And we're doing this in cooperation with uh, Redu Redu, uh, the festival uh, for, for indigenous people and indigenous arts here in Norway, and in cooperation with uh, Riksen, the venue, and also with Safe Muse, Safe Haven for artistic uh, for artists at risk uh, here in Oslo, and um, we're starting out with an opening talk by um, the UN Special Rapporteur of in the field of, of cultural rights, Karima Benoun, who uh, have um, a talk on uh, today's uh, theme. So please, Karima. Hello, my name is Karima Benoun and I am the United Nations Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights. I thank the organizers for inviting me to say a few introductory words and I send my warm cultural solidarity to all. I salute the organizers for convening this important event about indigenous people's rights and freedom of artistic expression. Much more work needs to be done at the intersection of these critical issues. Freedom of artistic expression is guaranteed by international law and is so important to human right that it is one of only a few rights found in both the International Covenants on Civil and Political Rights and on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, as well as in the touchstone instrument of the Human Rights Framework, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Artistic freedom should be fostered for everyone without discrimination. It has tremendous inherent value and is a key tool for achieving other human rights as well. Specific standards apply to the cultural rights of particular groups of people. For example, in her 2013 report on freedom of artistic expression, my predecessor as Special Rapporteur, Farida Shahid, emphasized the importance of Article 31 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in this regard. Indeed, I myself noted in my report to the UN Human Rights Council in 2020 on cultural rights defenders that cultural rights are essential to the struggles of indigenous peoples for human rights, including the right to self-determination and land rights. In the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the General Assembly noted that they have the right to practice and revitalize their cultural traditions and customs. The cultural rights of anyone including the cultural rights of indigenous peoples, do not and will not realize themselves. Hence, the work of cultural rights defenders who defend these rights in accordance with international standards is essential for guaranteeing the right to freedom of artistic expression, especially for indigenous peoples and other marginalized groups. Just to give one example, cultural rights defenders are often custodians of dying languages, especially indigenous languages. Indigenous languages are a source of identity, belonging, and knowledge systems that are critical to the survival of indigenous cultures. In the Cultural Rights Defenders Report, I gave the example of Patricia Sanchez Santiago of the Alliance for Indigenous Women in Central America and Mexico, who is preserving her language through storytelling and poetry. She is one of so many indigenous artists using artistic work to defend cultural rights. While there are many underlying challenges to highlight associated with work in the artistic and cultural sectors around the world, 
At the moment, I am especially concerned about the impact of COVID-19. My new report for the UN Human Rights Council this spring focuses on COVID culture and cultural rights and warns of a global cultural catastrophe with severe long-lasting consequences for human rights unless urgent rights-respecting measures are implemented to deal with the effects of the pandemic. In many contexts, members of marginalized groups that face structural inequalities, including indigenous peoples, have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Indeed, the UN Secretary General's first policy paper on the pandemic released in April 2020 and entitled, We Are All In This Together, called for responses to be shaped by human rights and specifically noted that the crisis poses, quote, cultural threats to indigenous peoples, unquote. Any meaningful human rights account of pandemic impacts must begin with those affected by the disease itself. Many cultural figures who are irreplaceable have died due to the virus around the world, such as Sylvia Morton, a Kawia Native American woman who gave classes to promote cultural heritage on reservations in the United States. She is tragically only one example of far too many who have been lost in every region. The human and cultural impacts of these losses must be recognized and addressed. It is essential to honor the memories of all who have fallen in the culture sectors to COVID-19, making absolutely sure that this includes indigenous artists and cultural rights defenders who we've lost. We must do this by memorializing their work, supporting those who continue such artistic and cultural work, and by promoting a nourishing cultural life for everyone in accordance with international legal obligations. The report lays out a cultural rights-based framework for action under the rubric of cultures, much of which is relevant to our topic and to the future of the artistic freedom of indigenous peoples. One of the COVID-19 report's key recommendations is to assess the impact of all pandemic measures on indigenous peoples and other marginalized groups, including those working in the cultural sectors, to ensure that they have benefited equally. And when I present the report this week to the UN Human Rights Council, I will underscore this recommendation. With regard to Indigenous peoples specifically, such an assessment must include reference to their particular international legal status under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Culture is the heart of our response to COVID-19. And as stressed in the culture's framework enumerated in my report, this response must include guarantees for the cultural rights of everyone. So in conclusion, let us work together to ensure that the issues of artistic freedom and the rights of indigenous peoples and their important intersections receive adequate attention going forward through the pandemic and hopefully soon out of the pandemic. Thank you, and I wish you an excellent conference. Thank you so much, Karima Banun, uh, for these inspiring and also um, interesting uh, words. Uh, so this will be the backdrop for our talk today. And in addition to the work we're doing in Safe Muse and also for the Artistic Freedom Week, Freekunst, there's another backdrop. And that's the State of Artistic Freedom, the report from Free Muse, just uh, published uh, a week ago, um, which is actually not so uh, inspiring. Uh, the re this is an annual report documenting breaks of artistic freedom around the world. And uh, Free Muse documents 978 cases with breach of, of artistic freedom, Tw 82 um, imprisonments, 133 uh, detained, 109 prosecuted, and 17 killed artists due to their artistic work. So by this, I'm inviting Sandra. Um, Sandra Maria West, are you there? Hello. Uh, yeah. Nice to see you. And uh, sorry you couldn't join us here at, at, at Riksen, but uh, you're far north of the Polar Circle. 
in in uh, in uh, in in the region where you live. And I wonder, could you say a bit about uh, about the work you're doing as as the leader of the uh, Redu Redu Festival, and and the role of the Redu Redu Festival for Indigenous peoples? Yes. Uh Redo Redo Festival is uh, an indigenous international festival and we present art in uh, many different fields or everything from music, uh, um, visual arts, literature, uh, films um, and uh, we also have uh, seminars and, and uh, debates and programs for children, youth and adults and uh, Redo Redo was established in 1991 um, as a protest against uh, the shame that uh, many uh, many Samis felt um, after the hard uh, assimilation politics that the Norwegian government had uh, um, had um, directed against uh, Samis, so it was a cultural revolt and and still is in many ways. And our aim is to present indigenous art and especially Sami art. On, um, on our own terms, on the artist's own terms, and from a Sami perspective. And uh, from the Sami area, in addition, we have, uh, we're joined by Ella Maria Eira. Hello, Ella. Ella, are you there? Hi, Boris. <laughs> Hi, good to have you here. And uh, could you say just a few words about the work you're doing as, as an artist and activist? As an introductory? Yeah, I, I work uh, quite proudly with my art uh, across roads between music, film, installations and storytelling. But I am deeply uh, rooted by um, uh, my uh, culture and especially the reindeer herding. So that's uh, one of the most uh, and the biggest uh, inspirations I have. Mm. And, and uh, how do you feel the role of, of the Ridu Ridu in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the consciousness of other, uh, uh, artists in, uh, for, the, for the race of consciousness, for, for artistic freedom and artistic work amongst the Samis? Ridu Ridu has, has been an important place or? Yes, uh, Ridu Ridu Festival is one of our in uh, important, most of the, the most important festival we have. And on, that's, um, uh, that is why it is, it is so important to have such arenas as Ridu Ridu, where we can be ourselves and not just for decoration, and where we can feel safe, where we can represent ourselves and our art. Uh, and so on, and, but also where we can meet and talk with other Sami people, indigenous people, to have a safe uh, space. So Sandra, how would, you, how would you explain or how could you uh, say anything about the, the, the space or the room or the freedom for Samis in the Norwegian or the Nordic societies today? Wow, uh, that's an easy question to answer to. <laughs> no, um, it's uh, quite complex and it's uh, in many ways, it's like kind of double or dual. Uh, like on the one hand, uh, Sami art and Sami artists uh, have gained uh, big visibility and are uh, praised on national television and on, also on the Norwegian national arenas. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we ha are, are still lacking uh, land rights and a lot of like basic rights in SAPMI. Uh, and also there is um, at times a very hard uh, or harsh uh, debate climate or as a Sami person to participate in a debate. Uh, it's very challenging. Um, and when you say, uh, sorry, and when you say SAPMI, uh, for those who's not not uh, so known to 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 this uh, area where the Samis live, it's it's across Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. That's correct. Yes, that's right. Uh, that is the traditional Sami area, and uh, 
and uh, we we live across the borders that the nations uh, nations made. And and uh, and also the Samis. I mean, it's not one kind of 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 uh, indigenous group. There are different cultures within the Sami culture. Yeah, Satmi is very big and it's very diverse also. And I think that is also something that is lacking in the public image of Samis in, in Nor Norwegian media, for example. Uh, both the fact that the Sami culture is very varied, that we have 10 different Sami languages, it's something that most Norwegians don't know. Uh, and also when Samis um, say something or state something in the media, uh, it is often um, um, made uh, or taken into a, a account as a statement uh, for all Samis. Like if a Norwegian person says something to the media, it's just that person's opinion. But if a Sami person says something in the media, then it suddenly people just think it applies to all Samis and they don't think about or reflect about the fact that, you know, Samis, we are also individual people and we have, have different opinions and it's nothing, it's nothing sensational about that. Ella Maria, um, you're a very active artist and um, uh, I wonder when you do your work, do you reckon or do you think closely uh, how it will be uh, received? Uh, do you feel free to express yourself or, or how do you feel you, your room for expressing your, your art, your freedom? Ella. Hi. I always start to tell people uh, where my home is and my home is where my reindeer are. And we never stand still. We're always moving from summer to winter pasture area through the eight seasons. I live here in Gordegeno, I work here, and I sit here and com communicate with the world from here. So having a home is really important for me. But now in the recent years, I have not felt safe anymore. For you must know that my home is not just this house where I sit now or this place. Um, and uh, in recent years, I, we have fought and we have been in court against the Norwegian government many times. And, and not only us, but other reindeer herders also. Uh, and it's about fighting for our own existence and for our rights. Uh, so we are losing more and more of our reindeer herding uh, grazing areas to mining, to monster power lines, to windmills, uh, to building new roads and cabins and so on. So we cannot afford to lose more land now. And if we do, we don't have any uh, future in the reindeer husbandry anymore. So, but we're also experiencing the major climate changes and that is affecting us really much. Uh, like last year, we had a huge uh, grazing uh, cr crisis at the same time as the COVID-19 came. So there were thousands of reindeers starving to death. Uh, so we had to feed our herd for the first time. So, um, and, I, and, and, and last year I made a short documentary film called Alat. Uh, Alat. And, uh, and I, I, I remember after the film premiere in January this year, I, I registered that there was a local journalist in Tromsø who wrote about my film. In her review, and it became very clear that she had no idea what she was writing about because she wrote that I was abusing my animals and, and that, I, and that I, and I skinned my animals alive. And then she also wrote that we, our reindeer herding district, had made all of the ugly roads in the nature, which you could see in the movie. But in the fact, uh, and in the reality, it is Statnet who has been uh, making all of these roads. So that made me uh, really sad. Uh, but that's uh, how I feel like how it is when people do not know uh, and have not enough knowledge about us and 
you know, and we live in a different way, like the people in the cities. So I, I think it's always talking about these things and getting, trying to get the message out. It's always difficult because I feel like sometimes people do not understand me and they maybe do not take it seriously. And to be honest, I'm like really tired of talking about these things over and over again. I've been doing that in like for the last 15 years now. And, and, I, and I think that, um, and I always want that, I wish that my art could like speak for itself, but um, yeah. But it's not the, the, the general background understanding uh, of, of, of the Sami or your background is, isn't there. But, but your artwork is very closely linked then to the situation you're living in and the work with the reindeers and and the respect for nature maybe but but um uh, uh it's it's uh, it's not understood is this what you're saying yeah sometimes people misunderstand me and sometimes uh, consciously <laughs> consciously misunderstanding or or uh, i mean uh, what i wonder is if you f if you feel uh, you have a f you have the freedom to express yourself and is and you met with trolling or is it just misunderstanding i don't know maybe both and uh, and because i sometimes uh, i um, i have provoked people like in the big in industry and and sometimes people do not maybe understand because they don't have enough knowledge and i have i'm trying to explain and explain how important like the reindeer herd is, herding is for us because we get so much from the reindeer, like uh, the rich culture and the rich, uh, rich Sami language and all of the uh, traditional uh, clothes and traditional food. And that is like facts. I, I, I wish I, <laughs> I didn't have to <laughs> tell people. Uh, yeah, so, um, but I, I experience sometimes that people get really uh, angry at me. Um, because I believe that my art has a such strong and clear message and I always tell the truth. Uh, so I feel like uh, uh, creating art is like kind of weapon for me uh, and I, yeah, and how I want to reach out to be people. And I, and I do that, especially outside uh, Norway to the international audience. But when you think of a new project, doing a new art project. Are you then conscious and, and do you think um, uh, to be careful not to, to be met by trolling or met by, by harassment or do you just go on? I go on, always. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's what I'm doing the last year. That's years. good to hear. That's good to hear. But Sandra, what do you think? I mean, is this a general thing among Sami artists? Or, or is, is, uh, do you think uh, also Sami artists, as other artists, know more and more, are careful thinking through what they're doing? Sandra. I think there is always a cost of, uh, of being so vocal and so direct and honest as the Ella Maria is. And I'm very happy that she just, you know, goes on. But I also know it's a cost. And uh, I know, like, in many instances, if, if there is a public debate, um, you always kind of think about what is the cost for me personally to speak up about an issue that is a Sami issue. Um, and I think the cost is higher if you are already marginalized, if you are an indigenous person, or if you are also a woman, and especially if also an indigenous woman. And uh, I see also a lot of um, uh, the harsh uh, writing about the reindeer herding, uh, reindeer herders in, in the media and uh, when uh, when they stand up for their basic rights uh, for reindeer posture, for example, then they are looked upon as um, uh, someone who is sabotaging the prosperity or the free or the future of uh, Norwegian industry, for example. And that is a lot of pressure to put on on uh, young people. So yes, I think it's definitely uh, a cost for for. Uh, 
for Sami artists to stand up, but I'm also very happy that uh, that they that uh, they still go on and also continue with this uh, honest speech, which I think is very important. And when you program for the festival, is this also something you have to take into account? Uh, how the programming is met by the general public, by the press? No, we don't care about that. You're just as stubborn. <laughs> we make a festival that we ourselves want to experience. We want to show everything that is the coolest, the most current, the best of indigenous and Sami art. And like we really want to go to this festival and then everyone, everybody else who wants to come are... Uh, are welcome, but they have to be prepared to look at the world from our perspective through Sami eyes. And I recommend to visit the festival. I've been there several times, so uh, so keep on the work. But you say it, there's a cost for indigenous people. And now I like us to have a small uh, input if from uh, an activist from the indigenous people's shore in Russia, but she had to flee because of her activism. Jana Tangasheva uh, has made this uh, movie or this film input for us. So please. Do I miss home? Every day I wonder how they're doing there in far off Siberia with the dust, the black snow and coal. The coal slurry flowing the rivers. Coal. I hate. My name is Yana Tanagasheva. I'm from Kuzbas, the coal region of Western Siberia. I left because of persecution and threats. In 2018, my husband, children and I were forced to flee Russia and request political asylum in another country. I belong to the shore people who are indigenous people of this region. There are only 12,000 of us left. The region has a population of almost 2.5 million. It's everywhere, all around. The open pit mines, open coal mining, explosions, dust, black rivers, foul taiga, a battle for life. Do you know what pain is? What coal is? These are synonyms for me. Do you want to know how coal is mined in Siberia? 10 stories about coal. That was the first story. So, very harsh pictures, and this is one group of indigenous people on our planet, and we've seen it all too often. And then we have people working with artists and uh, having um, the privilege of working with, with artists who have, have uh, a need for expression. So, Cliff Moustache. You're the artistic leader of Nordic Black Theatre here in Oslo. How do you re react when you see pictures like this? I think it's nothing new. I think this has been going for years. I think it's just a pity that the world has not realized the need. Doesn't realize that people are living into such a conditions that we need to listen to them to give them the space, to get the freedom, so they can live a decent life. I think it's not new at all. And that makes you really think about how long will it take before this change will come, so people can get a decent life like anybody else. And uh, Karima says uh, in her opening that uh, culture is the heart to our response. She said to COVID, 
But is culture also the heart to the response of this? I think there's two things, you know. I think we have responsibility. We have also the possibility, if we've got responsibility, then we could explore that freedom of expressions. Culture is a way to express the voiceless, the needless, those that we never hear or, 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 or see. So we, some of us, decide, uh, decide that we need to get the voice. If not, nobody will know their existence. So this is a freedom that artist has as a tool to bring forth that sort of the wealth of the people that are unseen, that are, not, are voiceless and are not being taken serious and homeless. And people are always moving because artists, because they take responsibility, we try to close them even more. And that's why we have artists at risk taking care of them, giving them the voice, giving them the, 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 the sort of the place to stand on, to express themselves. It's so important that responsibility that some are taking. And I think they don't know, we, the, and there's two things in politics. People say art is politics. No, we think because the artist has been ignored, the voices has been ignored, because politics should really listen and make changes and give the voices in democratic states that we talk about democracy, democratic, they should be given the, the possibility whereby we could see the, the, uh, the sort of diversity of people in this world with so much riches and tools. These things are not really there right now. But through the work of Nordic Black, you are striving to get there. <laughs> so. So this is the reason for, for establishing Nordic Black. How long have you been running this, uh, yeah. this uh, theater? Yeah, it's, it started in 1992. And why did you do it? Because when you come to a new country, you have this dream, you have this love, you want to belong, you want to be part of something, you want to enrich yourself, you want to, you know, you get curious about other people in the society. We think about there's so much narratives you hear every day and so many narratives you don't hear. And I thought about, where are the other narratives that I don't hear? But we, I have, we already had theatres in Oslo, all over Norway, and you create another one. Why? No, because we were not visible. Our voice were not heard. The voice, when we, I came to Norway, as I finished my, my study in England, I want to work with theatre. I should not create Nordic Black Theatre if the possibilities were there. They were not. They were institutions theatre that were doing the work they were doing all the time. They don't, they were thinking what they were doing is what is theatre. The references of theatre was what they had. But I have a different background, so I thought, about, if I want to work with theatre, where can I get a job? What can I do? What can I tell? What, is, what narratives I want to tell? Those narratives that were not been told that's why Nordic Black Theatre started to tell those narratives and include those people that their voice will never be heard, their music will never be heard before, so that we give them the, the room to belong to the new society we are today. And it's still going on. It's still a big struggle that we're taking now. But at the same time, there's so much understanding, there's so much positivity going on in this society. People realize that we need the space, we need the room, we need to breathe as human beings. And um, in addition to the theater, you also do development work for young, uh, talented people. You, you run a school, I think, or, or education. Um, this is awarding work. You feel it's inspirational or is it a struggle yeah, for we both? We always think about tomorrow, not about today. Because if you don't prepare the young people for tomorrow, if you not pave the street for them so that they know they can walk with the street up, head up, then probably that's, then they will understand that there's a possibility for them. Working with young kids because with kids and young talented people and also people, young people with disability, physical disability, we work with because we think art is a vehicle to lift them in a society whereby there are so little possibility. I think if we don't take care of the future, then we are at risk to have a better life to come. So you work with young people wanting to tell their stories 
This, this includes uh, all kinds of minority people, indigenous people. Uh, what kind of projects do you do? Well, that's a big... We can talk the whole <laughs> night, Jan, if you want to. I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about life. I always don't plan. I think about what is the narrative, what's going on, what is the narrative we like to tell? And I like community. The community is what I relate to. I talk to my community. I talk to young people a lot about what do they want to see? What can we tell? What is important? And then I get the feedback. And then I said, okay, then I know that I don't do it as an artist for myself. I do it because there's a need. The community wants it. And if I can't do something for them, for my community, if I can't get my community to a, a higher ground, a richer possibility, then my work is not in vain. So for me, and then to see a lot of young people who's got talent and the institu institution are not like getting them the possibility to explore the art. Art is a free tools and they're not being given the tools. And then we talk about all the, that, that experience you have, share it with those generations because when we, we finish this work, these kids will bring the, the work further on. Work is evolve all the time. It moves all the time because that's why we're doing what we do now because we want the future. We want this mother earth to be rich because we have to do that little bit we can when we have the possibility. And that's why Nordic Black Theatre has been a very good uh, vehicle because I've learned by doing, learned together with my friends that we need to be a part of the multicultural society, which no way is. We, 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 we need to enrich the society. We need to belong to something whereby we feel we are just part of a, of a country where we feel we are citizens of the world. If you want to do something and you don't belong, you're always be going to be skeptical about the people, about the country, because you see, they don't give me space. Yes, they don't give you space, take the space, take the room, because you know you have the tools to develop what you have, you have narrative to share. Look at that. When Nordic Black City starts, I thought about why I don't hear those big canons writers from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America on stage. There was nothing. So suddenly it was very aerocentric. And theater is not aerocentric because if you go into the theater, the history of theater, you know theater has been living a million years before. Storytelling. I, a child, I learned storytelling when I was three, three, three years old. Every full moon, the neighbors gather outside. And this, this moment, we don't go to bed unless our parents tell us the story is over. People sit there, share food, share stories the whole night. That's the most beautiful gift one can get. And if I didn't get that, I wouldn't be where I am today. And through the work with the Nordic Black, do you feel Norwegian theatre, Norwegian culture has become more colourful? Yeah, I think it's a very, yeah, I think so, because I can see now, slowly they're taking other people with other nationality into the theatre. The school that we had, that we have today, is also giving a lot of things back to the society because a lot of actors who came to our school are working within institution theatre today. So, and film industries and TVs and all that, and I think that, we didn't have a, the society did not have the visions. And I thought we opened their visions a little bit by enriches their art uh, that much that we've done today. And I think it's a very good contribution and we're still doing it because we think it's not very much still. And we need to make sure that the work that you do, the involvement you have, is not because you know it's nice, it's because it's part of your life, it's your part of obligations. It's a part of something that we, give, because without that, what is your life? Cliff Moustache, uh, Nordic Black Theatre. And here's another uh, uh, activist, culture activist, um, Marianne Sharifi. She's, for the time being, living in Harsta, up north in Norway. But uh, she established a festival in Afghanistan as a Hazara before uh, she came to Norway. This is in Norwegian. I will give you a short resume after the video. Hej alle sammen. Jeg skulle være med i dag der som dere sitter. Men på grunn av situasjonen og så mye å gjøre, kunne jeg ikke være med, dessverre. 
I stedet fikk jeg et spørsmål for å svare. Hva kunstnerisk ytringsfrihet betyr for meg? Og hva det ville bety for Hazara-folket om de hadde det? Jeg mener alltid det er kunst og kultur som holder et samfunn i livet. Og alltid kunst og kultur henger sammen. Et samfunn uten kunst. Kunst og kultur er et dødt samfunn. Derfor jeg har prøvd alltid til å skape noen kunstneriske aktiviteter som jeg kan. Fra det landet jeg kommer fra, ytringsfrihet er bare et ord, ikke handling. I løpet av den lange krigen i Afghanistan har kriger og krigere angrepet kunstverk og jeg og mange andre ser på Buddha-statuene som kunst som ble ådelagt 20 år siden jeg kommer fra en folkegrupp som i mange år har blitt undertrykt og nesten alt tilhører oss er ådelagt eller er skammelig Derfor måtte vi gjøre noe for å informere mitt folk om deres kunst og kultur. Festivalen A Night with Buddha hadde som mål helt fra staten å åpne dialog om kunstnerisk ytringsfrihet. Det var ikke lett å lage en festival i Afghanistan, fordi jeg mente det er en del av kunstnerisk mitt ansvar å løfte fram kunst og kultur som en vei til fred. Det var en farlig mening å ha i Afghanistan. Flere mistet livet på grunn av sine mening og handling. Og handlinger. Men jeg er fremdeles sikkert på at det er riktig. Og så langt har jeg sett festivalen vår har vært med å engasjere folk litt mer enn før. Undertrykte folk møtes og snakker sammen og blir mer bevisste. Noen hadde ikke kunnskap om frihet tidligere. Og jeg ser en stor betydning også for dem. Thank you, Mariam. And these kind of people, I mean, uh, the work Mariam has done creating a festival in uh, Afghanistan for the Hazara people to memorize the, um, the Buddha statues that were, were torn down uh, 20 years ago. It's so impressive. And she says that... Um, uh, Art and culture is is uh, is a core to uh, to th to the people, and um, uh, and that she always have tried to create uh, art activities to increase the awareness amongst her people, the Hazara people. She says in Afghanistan, freedom of expression is just a word. There's no action. And during the long war in Afghanistan, wars and warriors has attacked artworks. And more or less everything that was left uh, of the Hazara culture is either torn down uh, or is destroyed or it is uh, full of shame. So uh, uh, what she says is that the work of, of with this festival is to increase the uh, the consciousness and and um, and to make people more aware of their old culture or the the Hazara culture. So the festival, a night with Buddha, uh, was a place was a, a, a vessel to open up for dialogue about art and freedom. And uh, of course, there was not an easy task to develop this in that environment. But uh, she believed that was the only thing to do. 
and that it is a way, it's a path to peace. Uh, today she's doing this from Harsta, North Norway. Uh, and she's also developing this uh, in Harsta. And she says, I'm, I'm uh, sure that this is the right thing to do. The festival contributes to engage more people, little by little. Suppressed people meet, talk together, and get more conscious. And uh, some coming there have no knowledge about freedom, but through the festival, they get more uh, conscious and get more knowledge. So you can relate to this, Cliff. Yes, definitely. I think, uh, I think this is what we want to share, the narratives, it, because if not, it'll just be disappear. These were why a lot of history, stories and histories and books, and, 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 and like you say, they destroy the monuments that, has, that, that carried that immense history because they're afraid of that and dis destroy it because people are getting very narrow in the way of thinking. But then we cannot let them do that because art is a very important tools, is a vehicles to liberate our soul, is a vehicles to spread knowledge. If we don't do that, then everything will be closed down. Nobody will know this thing exists. I think those people have given the life for something which is so important for mankind or for the world to realize that we are rich. We cannot take away that richdom, which is art and culture, because people misunderstood how powerful those artists has been or the art beforehand has been, because we felt that you know, it gave people a possibility to express, to extend, to really give the strong uh, uh, um, ideas or thoughts about what is important to share. That's why a lot of places in the world, they, they, they lock artists down. This is the truth. The truth is more stronger than any weapon. Artists don't fight with no weapons. They fight with the truth. And that's why we destroy them. So that's also what you do, uh, Ella Maria. You fight with the art. You don't fight with weapon. Ella. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I do that. And that's my weapon, uh, art. But at, like the last years I have, like I said, I've been fighting in so many years with my family and with my brothers and sisters and other Sami reindeer herders. And I, I have been in court so many times. Last time I was in court was in this January in Tromsø, while I had a film premiere at Tromsø International Film Festival. So, and I know before we go into court, uh, we, we, we lost every time because we are fighting against the Norwegian government. They are owning the company and they are deciding. So, um, as a Sami artist, uh, it's it's really tough and, and 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 it's a hard job to be. And I feel like I have a huge uh, responsibility, and uh, and because there is so much we have to deal with, uh, like we are fighting against big forces, and we just want to tell our own stories in different ways through art, uh, which sometimes scares me. And just just to to. to could you give us uh, just a short resume? What's this court case about? It's not about your art, is it? It's about the reindeer herding. Yeah, but I'm making also art about it. I'm telling a story through my films and installations and through my music. So I've been documenting uh, this case in many years with my sister. And uh, we've been in court uh, uh, and through... Um, We've been in court, uh, <laughs> what is the English word for it? Mot Statnet, against Statnet. And, and they are building a huge monster power line uh, through our uh, summer and uh, autumn herding pasture area. And so they're like, it's... take our land away from us and we are losing our lands. So we don't know where to go anymore. So it's actually the power supplies 
the line for power supplies that is disturbing or taking away the land that you've been using for, for years for, for the herding? Yeah, exactly. Where my ancestors have been in many, many years, hundreds of years. And you, you, uh, the artwork you do is 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 kind of, it's a part of the struggle. Yeah, of course, and I, but I also I'm traumatized through all of these years, and it's so, uh, I it's so hard to see like just to see my in my father's eyes and when he's talking with our lawyer and I'm standing there and filming and he's not telling to me, but he says to his lawyer, our, our lawyer, that we don't, if this continues, we don't have any future anymore. And we know that if the Sami reindeer herding disappear, then a lot of the Sami culture will disappear and many of our traditions. And I think this is happening uh, through uh, to many, many indigenous people around the world right now. And yeah, it's uh, really So uh, Sandra, in Bamiyan in Afghanistan, it was the Taliban who blew down the, who, the, the, the Buddha statues. Mm -hmm. And in Norway, it's the state power company actually run by the state who is uh, uh, taking away the, the, the basis for the Sami culture. It's, it's, is is uh, comparison totally out of out of perspective, or what do you think? Well, the parallel here is indigenous people's rights to exist, uh, and that's that's the the parallel in these two uh, in these two cases, and uh, the right the right to express ourselves, uh, the right to speak up, the right to continue our traditions. Uh, and that's what uh, what um, um, Ella Maria is fighting for, and that is what uh, Jana is fighting for also. Uh, and I think also a big part of indigenous art and also the, the fight that uh, Cliff is doing and the work he's doing in Nordic Black Theatre, it's about also being represented or just the right to be present in, in the places where to be visible and also to have uh, uh, people to look up to. For example, Mari Boyne, who has been a trailblazer in, as a Sami artist. And I'm sure like she has opened a lot of doors uh, that of course Ella Maria now can, uh, uh, that she can enter these stages. And, and Ella Maria will again open doors for future Sami artists and the future Ella Marias. But you also cooperate with, or you invite indigenous artists from uh, lots of places for yes. your festival. Yes, we do. We invite indigenous peoples from all over the world. And actually, it's not the thing that uh, indigenous uh, peoples are so alike or that we have so much in common. But the thing we have in common is the strategies that mm -hmm. uh, that the uh, colonizers have used against us, the colonizing states, they have all used the same strategies against us. Mm -hmm. They have taken our culture, they have taken our land, they have taken our language, they have taken our songs, uh, they have taken uh, uh, taken the basis for, for our lives. And, and that is common for all the colonizing states. And that's why we have the same traumas, the same experiences, similar histories. And what we do at Redo Redo is, is uh, to meet and to discuss and find out which solutions, which strategies can we use as indigenous peoples to overcome this, to have a future. In the opening talk, uh, Karima Banun talked about COVID, COVID-19 being a global catastrophe um, and uh, which will cause several long lasting uh, consequences on cultural rights and that high profile artists, activists, and tradition holders amongst um, uh, lots of people around the globe uh, having, having uh, died from COVID. Uh, how do you see, Sandra, the COVID in influencing on the, on the, 
the Sami artists' possibilities these days? Well, I think like globally for indigenous people, COVID is uh, a big trauma for two reasons it, uh, it affects us. One thing is, of course, many elders uh, getting the virus and dying, and they are, are the tradition, uh, the language speakers, the language bearers and cultural bearers. And the other thing is that uh, the, there is less um, media attention to indigenous issues. So it's easier for the states and for the industries to hide uh, hide uh, their wrongdoings against indigenous peoples. And I think for SAPME, like the biggest effect is that the borders are closed. Like I can't meet my cousins from the other side of the border. Uh, we can't, uh, we can't gather across the borders and we don't have these meeting places uh, that are so important for evolving our um our society, our art, our culture, mm. and especially, of course, for Sami artists who have uh, lost a lot of their uh, their jobs uh, in this crisis. And Cliff, how is the COVID uh, inflicting on the on the work you're doing? Of course, it, it it it's 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 very vital because what happened is that the our room where we we work are very limited. And you, get the, you don't get the same possibility, the finance capital or the, the, the muscles of money to really to pay the people. So you have to be very, very careful. The thing is that the only thing we want to, know, we want to, 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 to do is that we, we want to believe that we don't want to be victim. We don't want to be a victim. We just want to use whatever the possibilities available now, especially with the technology. We try to work, to expose our work by going right now on, on there. Because if not, our narratives will not be heard. Our people don't know, will not know our, our existence because as, uh, as, as, as the media is not looking at the uh, indigenous people or the minority problems at all. They're talking generally, they forget that we are so many more than what they're talking about. We, we are much, uh, uh, we're not important anymore in the COVID. We are the less neglected, we're the most neglected group so far, economically, media-wise, and all that. So of course, but at the same time, we need to keep our focus there because if we few who have the positive possibly to expose the work doesn't do that, then suddenly everything will lay flat down. Ella Maria, culture is the heart to our response. Um, the way I understand you, you're fully behind that, also during COVID. Yes. Uh, but I think the most important thing, what is uh, the core of the Sami, uh, people and culture is the nature and we, we, we must not forget the nature in when we're talking about COVID and everything uh, because like in the Sami culture we always say the nature doesn't need us but we need the nature so we have to take care of the nature and it's about do we as human want to exist existence or survive on the earth so I think we, we have to start to act now because we are just guests on the earth. Mm. Yeah, nice closing comment. Take care of Mother Nature. And it goes not only for the Samis, it goes for us all. Even for old white-haired, uh, white male uh, people. Uh, so thank you so much. I think it's nice to close off with a love song by Hamid Sakisada. This is a traditional love song from uh, the Hazara tradition. Hamid plays the dambura and, uh, and sings uh, this love song. And I'm closing off by thanking Karima Benoun, uh, Ella Maria Eira, Cliff Mustache, Sandra Maria West, Amit Sakisada, Mariam Sharifi, Jana Tanagasheva. And my name is Jan Lute Eriksen. So see you next time and take care. <laughs>
Thank you. 